All right, it's November 4th, 2020. It's a Wednesday. Um, and we're looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 4 now. This one's a little rough in terms of like application because again, one of the things that we don't want to do is over spiritualize every aspect of the Bible. What does that mean? Is that we're trying to find like a, a deeper hidden meaning in every part of the word. Now, sometimes, now to discern which one you, know, you have to go a little bit deeper or there's like a deeper meaning takes time as you work with the word of God more and more throughout the years. But just to give you guys a little a tip, when it comes to the word of God, sometimes they just give you something as just plain facts. Like this is something that just happened. Like for instance, when it comes to the temple, uh, building the temple and kind of like the measurements, the measurements are the measurements. There's nothing going to be like super deep or spiritual about it. And it's so easy to when you approach the Bible to make every little word, every period, every thought have a significant deep meaning. Sometimes they don't. It's just facts that you're just being presented with. And today, chapter four is very much the majority of it is just simply facts. This is just how they built it. This is what it was and this is what it functioned as. Uh, in regards to the temple of God. Now, there's this one principle that I want to draw from in today's passage, but I'm going to read through all of it. I know it's going to be a mouthful. It's going to be a handful. So just bear with me as you follow along in whatever translation you have. I'm reading from NIV. But before I continue, let me pray for us. God, we just thank you for this time. And as always, Lord, we just ask for your continual guidance and leading and blessing. Lord, remind us that you are always faithful and that we are to lean on nothing else but you. And so, God, may your people be as, so maybe, may we be as more grounded now in this season than ever before. We thank you and you said pray. Amen. All right. We're looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 4. Now, again, I'm going to read all of it, all 22 verses, so bear with me. It's going to be a mouthful, but... There's one thing that I want to draw from today's passage. Verse 1, it says, He made a bronze altar 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 10 cubits high. He made the sea of cast metal, circular in shape, measuring 10 cubits from rim to rim and 5 cubits high. It took a line of 30 cubits to measure around it. Below the rim, figures of bulls encircled it 10 to a cubit. The bulls were cast in two rows and one piece with the sea. The sea stood on 12 bulls, three facing north, three facing west, three facing south, and three facing east. The sea rested on top of them, and their hindquarters were toward the center. It was a hand breadth in thickness, and its rim was like the rim of a cup, like a lily blossom. It held 3,000 baths. He then made 10 basins for washing and placed five on the south side and five on the north. In them, the things to be used for the burnt offerings were rinsed, but the sea was to be used by the priests for washing. <laughs> He made 10 gold lampstands according to the specifications for them and placed them in the temple, five on the south side and five on the north. He made 10 tables and placed them in the temple, five on the south side and five on the north. He also made a hundred gold sprinkling bowls. He made the courtyard of the priest and the large court and the doors of the court and overlaid the doors with bronze. He placed the sea on the south side at the southeast corner and Hiram also made the pots and the shovels and sprinkling bowls. So Huram finished the work he had undertaken for King Solomon in the temple of God, the two pillars, the two bowl-shaped capitals on top of the pillars, the two sets of network decorating the two bowl-shaped capitals on the top of the pillar, the 400 pomegranates for the two sets of network, two rows of pomegranates for each network, decorating the bowl-shaped capitals on top of the pillars, the stands with their basins, the sea and the 12 bowls under it, the pots, shovels, meat forks, and all related articles. All the objects that Hiram Abi made for King Solomon for the temple of the Lord were of polished bronze. The king had them cast in clay molds in the plain of the Jordan between Succoth and Zerathon. All these things that Solomon made amounted to so much that the weight of the bronze could not be calculated. Solomon also made all the furnishings that were in, the temp in God's temple, the golden altar, the tables on which was the bread of the presence, the lampstands of pure gold with their lamps to burn in front of the inner sanctuary as prescribed. The gold floral work and lamps and tongs, they were solid gold. The pure gold wick trimmers, sprinkling bowls, dishes and censers, and the gold doors of the temple. 
the inner doors to the holy, most holy place and the doors of the main hall. All right. Very plain facts. Now, what do we do with this? When we look at the temple of God and the way it's described, it's actually a very beautifully built, extravagant, lavish structure. Like, uh, it's gold upon gold. Like, they said that it was 23 tons of gold were used. That's 23,000 pounds of gold, um, depending on what measurements you use, right? It's just a lot of gold, a lot of bronze. It's just an extravagant, almost kind of, when some people look at that, that was, oh, that seems too much. And then the question we have to ask yourself, is anything ever too much for the Lord? Because when you look at our faith, we're going to be, we can get religious in the sense that when we see extravagant use of resources or we see an extravagant use and design of a building or place of worship, we can easily look at that and says, what a waste of money. Now, even the Pharisees said that to um, certain people where they look at great acts of devotion. Like, for instance, the woman with the alabaster jar. Now, that was a perfume that had that was worth a year's worth of wages and so on average let's say if we were to make an equivalent like modern day price it would be roughly around like maybe 60 to 70 k 60 to 70 thousand dollars worth of perfume broken and used all at once to anoint the head of jesus now the disciples responded very religiously to that they said what a waste and some in some gospels say it was Judas who made this claim. Said, what a waste. That could have been sold and the money used to feed the poor. Now, if you look at that, that looks good on the outside. That seems, oh, wait, that's the, that's the thing to do. And obviously, right, that's when we just look at it for surface value, it's like, oh, of course, that is the better option. But that was also at the same time the religious response to an act of devotion to the Lord. Because Jesus doesn't say, you know what, you're right. He says, no, 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 you're not getting the situation right now because he says, I'm about to go and die for the sins of the world. And this woman, whether most likely because in inspiration of the spirit, did this beautiful act of devotion to prepare Jesus to die for the world. And when you look at the disciples response, you can say, okay, but that seems to be the right response. What Jesus is not advocating is that you should never take care of the poor because obviously he commands us to take care of the poor, to take care of those who are marginalized, those who are experience injustice or oppression. But oftentimes we could use these social justice movements as a cover up for religiosity and kind of lose sight of what our ultimate goal is. When God is at the center of our faith, social justice will be taken care of if we genuinely follow God wholeheartedly. But if we make social justice the center of our faith, that doesn't necessarily mean a deep, rich connection with Jesus Christ, which ultimately in the end, you might do earthly good, but in the end, you might have forfeited heaven in the process. And so that's why priorities and order matter in the kingdom. And when you look at the the temple you could easily look at it what a waste of gold what a waste of money what a waste of this what a waste of that but the question then goes back to is anything ever a waste when given unto the lord like for instance when someone spends a lot of money to make a nice sanctuary someone can look at this as oh but we could have used that money for something else i'm we could always make the argument right oh we could use that money for something else but there's nothing wrong with spending money extravagantly to create a space of worship to glorify god and to bless the people now then what do we do what what are we how are we supposed to kind of navigate through this and this is just um just my own opinion i think I think when we are trying to be extravagant with our resources and devoted to the Lord, like say for instance, more specifically in materialistic things like a worship space or building or whatnot, and we do it for God's glory, I think we should never shame a, 
a church or a congregation leader to make that decision. To say, you know what, I want to have a really nice sanctuary because I want this to be a place where not only is it going to be dedicated to Lord and we should give him our best, but I also want people to enjoy the space as they glorify God. There's nothing wrong with that. I'll never look at someone and say, if someone had like a very beautiful pulpit, I'm not gonna be like, oh, what a waste of money. I was like, oh, that was, I'm gonna in faith believe and assume the best of that person that they made that altar, that pulpit as a way of glorifying the Lord. Now, where we can really check ourselves is that when we look at the, the history and the trend of our using of our resources, we have to then ask ourselves is, are we constantly investing in materialistic things and say that's for the Lord, but never really live our, our faith to be compassionate, to take care of other people, to do things where you display more of the characteristics of God than making sure that you're doing the relig religious duties on the checkoff list. Because we can do all these extravagant, de outwardly devotions to the Lord, but then we have to ask in the inner spaces of our hearts and say, are we actually showing genuine compassion when no one's watching? Are we showing genuine care for people when no one is, when there's not an audience? And so it's like a, it's like, contextual right it requires a context like what's the context of what's being done what's the motivation of the heart when it's being done because it all needs to go down to the heart motive what is the heart motive behind the things that we do like what is the heart motive if our desire in the season is to make a beautiful worship space what's the motivation behind that is it for the glory of god or is it for the eyes of men or people if it's for the eyes of people then we have to check ourselves maybe recollect our resources and use it for something else. But if it's genuinely for the glory of God and we're not going to neglect the people around us, then I think it's okay. And then you're going to ask, but what about you? what you just said earlier, where the disciple says that money that was used for as a perfume could be devoted to feeding the poor rather than this one mo moment and act of devotion. Again, context matters. Context always dictates the the validity i guess of the situation of the action that we take in that very moment jesus says yes of course you do this but you will not always have me and so the focus is about in that very moment in time jesus was about to die for the world and in that moment that act of devotion was preparing him honoring him to die for the world He's saying, you'll always have the poor, but you won't always have me for this very moment. And so again, the context, the time, the place matters. Time and place, right? And so time, place, and heart motive are the three things that we have to check when it comes to using resources, especially if we're going to use resources to build an extravagant worship space, for instance. Time, place, heart. For the Solomon's temple or the temple of God, the time and place was a, a, for them to build a temple that God has placed on Solomon's heart because of his father, David. And the heart motive is obviously for a place for God to dwell with his people. And so time, place, motive. And so therefore, when you think about using your resources for God, whether materialistically like money or time or whatnot, and we're having all these issues of extravagance or whatnot, you got to go to three things. Time, place, motive. Well, one, your heart should always be devoted to the Lord in all that you do. That doesn't change by time or space. But more specifically in line of today's Bible passage, when it comes to using resources on materialistic things, like for instance, a sanctuary space, you gotta ask yourselves, is this the right time? Is this the right space? And what is my heart motive behind this? Because as I said before, when we focus on having a beautiful sanctuary, that doesn't mean that, like if we're focusing on beautiful sanctuary, it doesn't mean that having a less beautiful sanctuary so that we can help other people is more holier than the other option. And so it's something that we always have to discuss and pray for. One, I think above all else is the heart motive. What's the heart motive behind it? Because we could definitely make a space of worship that has nothing to do with glorifying God. It's just more about a monument to how 
wealthy we as a community has become. But if it's generally for the glory of God, then go for it. I'm not going to judge it, and neither should you or me. Where we look at that, look at a, a sanctuary space of, so, oh, that person, that sanctuary space has a great TV or great banner. It's like, oh man, what a waste of money. No, they if they did it to glorify God, then oh, so be it. But if it's a continual trend where they keep spending money for a beautiful sanctuary space, but it has no money allocated to ministering to people's hearts, then that's when we have to question it. Okay, what are we really doing? And what is truly our motive? And so I want to say to you, not just about sanctuary space or allocation of resources, but even your own life, time, space, and above all else, heart motive. What is the motive of your heart to do these things? All right. Very simple today. Try not to over spiritualize it. It is what it is. And so we're going to just have to kind of cut through a little of the, a little of the kind of like just face value passages. And then we'll get into the meat of the story in Second Chronicles. All right. Be blessed.